The setting is her house in Washington, where she lived for a few months after moving out of the White House. Her living room with its pale yellow chairs and favorite pictures on the bookshelves. As the tape recorder turns on, you hear the sounds of children in the background. Caroline, age six, John, age three. There are ice cubes in a glass. A match lights up her cigarette. And the time capsule begins to open. We see them again. The young couple who once held the promise of a brand new century. A young man filled with nerve and swagger. His luminous wife, lit by the sun, unaware they are racing toward tragedy. Again, it's just four months after his death, as she speaks in that singular, intimate, breathy voice. I mean, it's so strange these things that come back. Now, I always thought with Jack that anything he could make, you know, once he was in control, anything, all the best things would happen. In this childish way, I thought I won't have to be afraid when I go to sleep at night or wake up. It's so strange these things that come back. And so, she takes us there the day it began. The morning of a freezing cold inauguration, January 20th, 1961. It's like children waiting for Christmas or something, getting up and getting dressed, and the snowstorm, all the excitement. He is 43, she is 31, the youngest president and first lady in history taking over from Mamie and Ike. The Eisenhowers, the oldest couple in the White House, who have come to symbolize the conformity and conventions of America in the 50s. As her friend, renowned historian Arthur Schlesinger, asks her question, she emerges as a skillful and irreverent diarist of what people in the photos are really thinking. What does the president think of Eisenhower? Well, not much. You know, Jack saw that... All oh, that could have been done. I mean, how really he kept us standing still and gave away stuff. I don't think he thought much of him. And the sweet-faced, grandmotherly Mamie, what did Mamie think of her? Didn't President Eisenhower say during the campaign, whenever Mamie thinks of that girl being in the White House, she goes, <laughs> or raspberry or some charming sound? You know, there was this sort of venom or something there. As they leave for the ride to the Capitol, the amused young newcomer notices Mamie seems to have forgotten that Kennedy is the first Irish Catholic president. I was sitting in the car, President Eisenhower and Jack came out after her. I mean, she said, look at I Ike in his top hat. He looks just like Patty the Irishman. <laughs> and then I think she went. Then I um, wore the inauguration. During the ceremony, we saw only her unchanging smile. Mr. Robert Frost. But it was she who had invited the first poet ever to speak at an inauguration, Robert Frost, who was faltering in the blinding sunlight. It was such a glare from the snow that he really couldn't see what was written in the paper. No, I'm not having a good light here. And he looked like he was going to cry. And then Lyndon got up and held his hat over it. Yeah, let me have it. The 86-year-old decides to recite a poem from memory. Such as she was, such as she would become, has become, what she will become. And though we can't see it, she is in fact like radar scouting out friends and adversaries on the podium. Near her, their bitter rivals in the election, outgoing Vice President Richard Nixon and his wife Pat, working hard to smile through the bruises from that brutal defeat where they lost by 16 one-hundredths of one percent. remember Mrs. Nixon, who uh, looked really pretty that day. I thought if she, you could see she could really be rather New York chic when she wanted, mm -hmm. in sort of a black Persian lamb coat and hat. She watches next as her husband, the president, strides to the podium to deliver that soaring new vision for the nation. The torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. He issues a clarion call, 
for America to defeat the march of communism. And he calls for a new frontier of economic progress, fighting poverty, civil rights. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And everyone says, why didn't Jack kiss you after? Which, of course, you would never do there. But you had to march out in such order that I was about eight behind him with women or something. And I so badly wanted to see him before the lunch, just to see him alone. I went to a room with all the ladies where they had sherry and coffee, and he was with the men. And I caught up to him in the Capitol, and, um, oh, I was just so proud of him. And there's a picture where uh, I have my hand on his chin, and, uh, you know, he's just looking at me, and there really were tears in his eyes. Suddenly a flash came, because I didn't think there was anyone there. And in the papers it said, wife chucks him under chin. I mean, that was so much more emotional than any kiss. Because mm -hmm. his eyes really did fill with tears. I just say, oh, Jack, you know, what a day. Then we got in the car for that parade. You know, sort of not quite knowing how to wave. Yes. A brand new path ahead for all of us. Even though in our middle-class nation, it wasn't easy to fathom this new first lady. So golden and exotic, a debutante who grew up on a Newport estate and even spoke foreign languages on the campaign trail. People came up and used to be surprised that I could speak English. It's only now that the tapes reveal what was behind that finishing school smile. The dazzling Mrs. Kennedy was filled with dread. It's funny. Uh, I used to worry about going into the White House. It'll be a goldfish bowl, the Secret Service. I'll never see my husband. I spent so much time worrying, would it ruin our marriage to get <laughs> in the White House? She was intimidated. Frightened, after all, she'd never been a natural in politics. A plane from decades ago roars overhead. I was always a liability to him. Everyone thought I was a snob from Newport who had bouffant hair and had French clothes and hated politics. And he'd get so upset for me when something like that came out. And I'd, sometimes I'd say, oh, Jack, I wish, you know, I'm so sorry for you that I'm just such a dud. And he knew I loved him, and I did everything I could. It has only been two months since she gave birth to John Jr. by cesarean. She had put on a brave face for the star-studded receptions, the first time all of Hollywood would come to celebrate presidential glamour. There's Angie Dickinson and Frank Sinatra singing that old Jack magic. That old Jack magic. Have them in its spell That old Jack magic that he weaves so well But she's just too tired to watch all of the inaugural parade and by inauguration night doesn't know how she can make it to those five inaugural balls. In the 1960s, the pep pills of the day are amphetamines, readily prescribed by doctors. When it was time to start getting dressed, I couldn't get out of bed. I just couldn't move. And so I called up Dr. Travell, just frantic. And she came running over. She had two pills, green one and orange one. And she told me to take the orange one. So I did. And I said, what is it? And then she told me it was dexedrine, which I'd never taken in my life. But um, and then I never have again. But thank God, uh, it really did its trick. Because then you could get dressed, and then Jack came, and he came upstairs, and he brought me down to the red room. We all had a toast of champagne, and he did, he liked how I looked, and he said something so nice, and we went off to that ball. You know, there's that wonderful picture of him sort of pointing. It was like Cinderella and the clock striking midnight. I guess that pill wore off, because I just couldn't get out of the car. And so Jack said, you go home now. And he sent me home with that aid. 
Sometimes I thought later, I wish I'd been able to sort of share all that night with him. But he had such a wonderful time that he must have gotten home about three or four, but he came in and woke me up. And I slept in the Queen's room. He slept in the Lincoln room then, so that was his first night in Lincoln's bed. And, well, he was just so happy. Then the next morning when he woke up, very early, well, I, I, I was awake too, and so I went in that room, and it's the sunniest room. You know, we both sat in that bed. I mean, you did again feel like two children. Think of yourself sitting in Lincoln's bed. I don't know. And he went off with that wonderful springing step to his office, and then again. Life with him was always so fast that it isn't until you look back that you see what happened when.